like to welcome everyone here tonight and uh, also um, very grateful uh, for the fact that we're able to have uh, here present with us the speaker from Venezuela, uh, Steve Elner, uh, to give us a bit of an update and a bit of a discussion about what's been, been going on in Venezuela. Uh, for those of you who, aren't, who are unaware, uh, Steve Elner has uh, long time uh, been studying uh, Venezuela, specifically in the area of the labour movement. Um, but he's written also books about uh, left parties uh, in, historically in Venezuela and continues to publish a lot of material uh, looking at the, the Venezuela government and social movements uh, under Chavez today. And uh, he's uh, also at the Universidad de Oriente, uh, where he's been since 1977. Uh, since 1977, and he's also uh, uh, gives classes uh, in Mission Sucre, uh, which is the new uh, Bolivarian uh, higher education system uh, that's been set up by, by the Venezuelan government. Uh, so, we're, again, uh, very grateful uh, for Steve for being here. Also, I suppose I should mention that Steve's out here um, as a visiting guest uh, speaker on behalf of the ANU, the Latin American Department at the Australian University, National University, where he's been giving a number of speeches in Canberra uh, last week. But we're lucky to have him here in, in Sydney to give a talk tonight. And I think I'll, I'll leave the introduction there and just okay. pass it on to yeah. Steve. It's really uh, somewhat of a, a pleasure to um, to um, and be able to analyze and to share with an audience um, uh, viewpoints about events in Venezuela, um, far away from Venezuela, um, and to be able to develop uh, to have somewhat of a, a distant and objective. Uh, perspective as to what's going on, and I, Australia is really as far away from Venezuela as you can get without going to the moon. So this is uh, this is uh, beneficial for me to be able to to think in terms of um, an analysis uh, that is um, uh, far away from from the from the action. Um, in recent years, over the last couple of years. Um, the situation in Venezuela has become quite tense. Um, for Venezuelans who support Chavez, uh, it, the difficulties of shortages on the one hand, um, even accusations of corruption uh, within the Chavez government on the other, um, is uh, it ch changes really uh, the kinds of comments that you hear among people who are sympathetic, people who are even active, in the Chavez government is different from, say, uh, the first couple of years of Chavez. And, he, and when Chavez was re-elected president in 2006 by a very high percentage of the vote, 63 percent of the vote, which is really the highest percentage of any presidential candidate in modern Venezuelan history since 1958, um, in, in, in the last few years, in the last two, two and a half years, uh, electricity blackouts, shortages of, of basic items, um, have complicated the picture. But I think that uh, what really accounts for Chavez's political success, uh, as well as success from a, from a socioeconomic viewpoint, but his political success, his ability to you know, win all these elections, uh, which is really um, doesn't have any equivalent in Venezuelan history. So many elections uh, at all levels, presidential elections, recall elections, referendums, um, as well as internal elections, primaries for uh, candidates um, uh, that support Chavez, uh, the fact that Chavez has been so successful uh, from an electoral viewpoint, I think has a lot to do with the ongoing deepening of the process of change in Venezuela, beginning with his election, his first election in 1998. Um, the fact that this process has gone through what I'll call stages, uh, which represent a, a constant deepening, uh, a constant radicalization, uh, beginning with a first stage when he was elected in 1998. His program was more political than it was socioeconomic. Uh, there was a lot of talk of non-payment of the debt. And he, during the campaign, especially the, the last year, it was a long campaign. It was almost two years. By the, by the second year of the campaign, uh, he was emphasizing different options, 
a negotiated solution to the foreign debt. And his main focus was on a change of the Constitution, a constituent assembly, with a new political kind of model of direct elections, um, uh, a system of primaries, a system of uh, referendum, um, and socioeconomic <coughs> programs and demands were really subordinated to that central message. So that I would say the first stage was a, was a moderate stage. The Constituent Assembly was held in 99. It was approved of in December of that year in a national referendum. And the sec in the second year as well was focused on the Constituent Assembly. Um, there was radicalization in 2001 uh, with uh, 47 laws that were passed simultaneously as part of an enabling act. And that represent what I would call a, an anti-neoliberal stage, which goes from 2001 until he was uh, reaffirmed in power in the, primary, in the recall election that was held in August of 2004. So that that second stage was an anti-neoliberal. And now anti-neoliberal says what Chavez is against. It doesn't say, say what he supports. There wasn't any kind of substitute for neoliberalism. But it was anti-neoliberal because he put a hold to the privatization schemes that had been uh, that had been implemented and was were being implemented in the 1990s in aluminum, uh, in oil, which is the most important, in social security. Um, so that it was anti-neoliberal. In 2005, Chavez calls himself a socialist in January at the World Social Forum. And he expropriates companies that had been taken over by the workers during the general strike, or shortly thereafter, in 2002, 2003, January, December, January 2002, 2003. And the government did not take a position on those worker takeovers. The workers called on the government to support their um, takeover of the factories. But in 2005, the government nationalized several of those companies. So the outline of a new model emerges. And most important of all, the government redefines private property as a system of rights, but also obligations. And for instance, uh, in the case of these factories that were taken over, the government's position was, uh, you know, we will respect the rights of private property, but the property owners uh, have to live up to their obligations. If they don't produce, if they're not producing, if they're closing down, then the government will take over that property. Same thing with the agrarian, um, the agrarian reform that had been passed in 2001, uh, but was applied really for the first time in a big way in late 2004, 2005 to the private sector. Uh, um, estates that were not producing up to capacity. And that law defined uh, capacity as 80%. Uh, if the estates were producing less than 80%, <coughs> then the government ultimately had the right to take them over. So that uh, the, the thir this third stage represented the uh, emergence of a new model. Uh, and then when Chavez was re-elected president in 2006, in December of 2006, with, as I said before, 63% of the vote, uh, the government nationalized strategic sectors of the economy, or what they call in Spanish and in Venezuela, basic industry, which in this case took in um, cement, telecommunications, electricity, steel, uh, several, uh, well, at least one, one major bank, and the oil industry, which had been nationalized in 76, was being privatized in the 90s, and the Chavez government ruled that fi more than 50% of the ownership of all those mixed companies that had been created in the 90s had to be controlled by the state, by the state oil company, which, were, uh, which is PDVSA. And in 2007, after Chavez was re-elected president, uh, that increased to 60%. 